Thank you for joining us on The Author's Stage, an initiative highlighting writers and authors who call the Saratoga Springs, New York, and surrounding areas their home. The Author Stage is a community collaboration between Universal Preservation Hall, a member of Proctor's Collaborative, and the Saratoga Springs Public Library. And we are delighted to be broadcasting from the beautiful, great hall here at Universal Preservation Hall in downtown Saratoga Springs. Many thanks to all those involved who bring this project to life. I'm Trevor Oakley from the Saratoga Springs Public Library, and today I am excited to be talking to a self-described hopeful nihilist, misanthropic humanitarian, and bitter Buddhist, author of Storms of Summer, Scotch Sympathy, and another upcoming collection of poetry titled The Futility of Words, I'd like to welcome Michael A. Carroll, and thank you so much for taking your time to chat with us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Well, jumping right in. Where does the inspiration for your work, where did the inspiration for this particular book, I know uh, I'm focusing on Storms of Summer, that's all right. Um, so where does the inspiration for your work come from, generally? Uh, generally, the inspiration comes from just life in general. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to use poetry as like a form of uh, uh, therapy. so. It's, it's me getting my angst out and stuff like that. So that's where a lot of the inspiration comes from. The book was actually put together, though, because um, a friend of mine had asked if uh, I consider publishing, and I hadn't. So like, I, I got to work on self-publishing, collecting all these scrap pieces of paper and notebooks, and uh, here it is. <laughs> it's funny. I, you said the poetry, it's kind of it's, it's therapeutic. And so it's therapeutic for you as an author. I find poetry and this poetry to also be meditative. Meditation is therapy, and so it's meditative for the reader right. as well. So I feel that there's great benefit not only in this, but great benefit just in general of that. So, I mean, hey, thank you for no, that. I appreciate that. But um, no, it's, it's, it's a really, I, with poetry, I think it's a really um, interesting, and it's kind of this like special circle you know that kind of happens between poet and reader right so um so how it's funny <laughs> discussing poetry um so how did your sense of your audience influence your choices of the vignettes uh, elements of setting or tones details it didn't <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> no. Uh, no um i when i'm writing i'm writing for me and uh I feel that trying to take an audience into consideration would force me into some type of um, uh, censorship, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to yeah. be authentic, and uh, I feel that people might relate to that easier, too, is like just being real. That's interesting. Yeah, I actually hadn't thought of that before, that uh, having an audience in mind or a certain sense of audience would lead to some kind of self-censorship. It's almost like this kind of negative self-awareness yeah. or almost like you, you become afraid of yourself maybe. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. I had not thought of that before. And so that, that also sounds a little terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it can be. No, it can be. You don't know what lurks like behind your brain or anything. Sometimes stuff comes out and like you have to process it yourself. Uh, other people aren't going to really do that for you. Yeah. And again, it goes back to this therapy and then meditation. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, that's, this is, wow. Okay. This is, <laughs> that's, that's really, that's, that's, in, that's enlightening. I like that. Um, so can you share with us anything that you've edited out of your work or your works that you're either really happy about leaving out for whatever reason or, uh, any content that you know you left out that you wish you had kept in, you know, a particular collection or any or any work, you know. Um, I actually, <laughs> there was one poem I came across uh, months after uh, self-publishing, and uh, it was I just didn't know it existed. Oh. I forgot about it. I know, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a, a purposeful or any, it was. Oops. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but I'm actually gonna I'm gonna include that in the uh, the next collection though. 
um, now that I have it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, so I know uh, the intro to Storms of Summer, you're just kind of like, yep, this is a collection and here it is. So do you or have you since publishing that, do you have any kind of organizational scheme or... And, no, you know, it's <laughs> so you don't have the oops moment, or he's like, oh, this again, it, it is what it is. Just I've gone, I don't really like doing this, but I've gone digital with most of my writing now, so I can keep it in one place, so that's a little bit easier um, to keep track of. But um, there were some other like snippets of poems, um, or just like work that wasn't fully realized, um, ideas that I had that like weren't fully developed and I, I definitely need to like go in and uh, uh, like reestablish the idea I guess before it's before I can give birth yes <laughs> and it's funny you talked about going digital because yeah there isn't you, you, you talked about going digital and you'd also just a second earlier mentioned that you had you know the scraps of paper and isn't there just something like lovely and tangible <laughs> and artistic and just oh you have these scraps of paper and the napkins and it's right. like yes yeah and now you're like i'm using microsoft word <laughs> or whatever whatever it is you use i mean do you find do you find a, a change in how you approach the writing when you're sitting down in front of a monitor or a mobile screen of some sort versus the scrap of paper or you kind of like oh, i travel with my scraps and then i transfer them to digital like uh, I mean, digital is easier on my hands. I get yeah, yeah. Like really bad. <laughs> no, I'll start to write, and then my hand cramps like after like a couple minutes. So uh, oh. it's a lot easier just to uh, tap it into the phone or sit down at a desk and type. Um, but I, I mean, like some of the ideas suffer maybe a little bit, but not too much. Okay. Have you ever tried uh, dictation software or played with that at all? No, I haven't. Okay. No, just I've I've um, encountered. Uh, I know some other writers that for one reason or another, whether they've encountered a, a physical um, issue of some sort that made them you know, unable to write for long periods mm -hmm. of time, have played around with that. And so I didn't know if that was something that you would look at at all. Or is that almost too digital for you? Like, now I'm extremely self-conscious talking into this <laughs> digital thing, and <laughs> now what do I do with it? You know? No, it, that's, uh, that might be something to consider. Um, I do, before I do like open mics, um, I will record myself like reciting my poems um, just so that I can get comfortable and play with that. So that is something to consider definitely for uh, future work. So I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, now just, this is total curiosity because I, I, I don't, I haven't met too many people that love the sound of their own voice myself <laughs> included. How do you do that? How do you record yourself before an open mic and then say, that's awesome, I'm going for it? Or, I mean, just, how does that work? Because I try to accept the way I am. Awesome. <laughs> because, no, like, uh, that's something everybody goes through, and I'm realizing that everybody goes through it, so I'm no different. So I have to just come to that realization that, like, I'm not going to like my voice no matter what. Other people might. I don't. <laughs> well, I, I like the sound of your voice, so oh, you're welcome. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I, I love that sentiment, and I think that's something important that, um, yeah, if we could stop and think this thing where I'm not the f necessarily, I'm not necessarily the first person who has gone through this. Other people have done this, and they have had a level of success. I can do this, too. Right. I love that. Thank so, you. no, thank you. That's a that's a great great point. Yep. I am I'm I'm myself too. I'm another person. So, oh, right. Um So, how do you strike a balance between making demands on your readers versus uh, taking care of them or guiding them through the reading experience? I guess it's that question of how hard do you want your readers to work or how much work do you want readers to put in? Um, I keep balance with extremes. Uh, <laughs> I had one of my friends tell me that some of my poetry reminds him of um, Allen Ginsberg writing a poem about a Salvador Dali painting. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. I thought, no, I, I liked that. But yeah. Um, I, I can understand that. Like, some people might not appreciate it, but no, I. Um, some of my poems, I speak in like Jungian archetypes and um, like occult uh, symbology, or just um, no, like I just I 
I speak very cerebral in some. Other times, I'm very direct to the point. Um, okay, so you, yeah, you're saying that you. It sounds like you you play a little bit with you play a little bit with. Um, gosh, you, what do you say? You you mentioned Jungian archetypes. That's like in like philosophy or <laughs> schools of thought. Um, you're you're kind of playing in this yeah playing in the world of philosophy slash psychology and also with the occult and the symbology, which it's almost like. To me, these are very much, they, they can totally be one and the same thing because a lot of what people look at as a, you know, alternative science or, you know, occult science versus science of psychology or, or philosophy or something like that. Um, it's kind of like, well, it, it doesn't exist until it does. The giant squid right. was this mythical creature until we found a giant squid. Right. And so maybe in a way you're saying that you're playing in this, you know, with the poetry, you're kind of getting into this world of you've got your established philosophy or established psychology, and then you have occultism. And really, isn't there maybe some crossover because these things that were thought of as um, arcane or that they don't really exist or alchemical, well, when we learned how to do it, it became, quote, real. Right. Okay. Right, exactly. All right. I don't know if we, how we can turn that into something that they can use here, but all right, that's we we went around the bend, but we got there. Thank you. <laughs> and I got to say alchemical. All right, that was cool. <laughs> okay. Um, can you share with us any details about something you're working on right now, even if it's another creative pursuit that isn't necessarily literary? Sure. Um, I have uh, two novels and a children's book that have been in the work for um, like four years now, <laughs> but there's no set timeline on them. Um, the children's book, is, it's, uh, it's about this character, uh, Georgie Dingle, um, who he and his friend flush all the toilets in their house at the same time and get warped into this other world where everything's supposed to be scary, but as they travel along, they find out that the things that they're supposed to be afraid of aren't really that scary. So it's supposed to teach kids that like the things that we fear are sometimes a lot less scary than just fear itself. Okay, I, that's cool. And for that audience, or for that age, like, and the hook of, oh, we're going to flush all this at the same time. It's like, oh, I, I, I'm a guy in my mid-40s, and I'm like, I'm in. Like, <laughs> so, no, I, I, I like that. Um, yeah, because I think a lot of us, it, it's very easy to forget that, you know, the, the fears we had as kids, and that luckily, whether it was we had, you know, whether it was parents or books or, heck, even a TV show or another friend or family member, somebody that kind of helped us through these fearful things, you know, and now as grown-ups we look back and be like, oh, that was when it was easy. No, it wasn't. It was the same, just different. There were some different things that you might have been worried about or afraid of versus the things we might be a little worried about and afraid of today. So right. it wasn't any easier, it was just different. So let's all flush our toilets together, <laughs> get warped into a world, and allay our fears. Yes. Okay. I love it. <laughs> I know that there are um, working and aspiring writers in the audience, uh, so can you talk to us about the writing process, be it uh, a specific routine you have, maybe a time of day you like to write, or how you like to warm up and flex the literary muscles, um, or if you prefer, just any advice that you would like to share with the writers in the audience. No, oh, absolutely. Um, I, um, when, when I'm in the routine, uh, a meditation, 10 minutes every day, just like a quick 10 to 15 minute meditation. Um, and then right after that, I'll do uh, 10 minutes of free writing. I, I find that free writing actually really helps because it forces you to like improvise and think on your toes. And then um, on top of it, you stop judging that, uh, that inner critic and you just push stuff out. It doesn't have to make sense. But like, it definitely helps just get the creative juices going. And then reading also helps. 
because uh, obviously like it helps with sen sentence structure it introduces you to new words and um, yeah. just creative uh, ideas so as somebody that's never well, I shouldn't say never but I'm I'm honestly not sure if I, I have done this before, but when you say free writing, like, how do you get started? What is it? Is it just like the kind of, just start with a word, any word, and then associate from there and go on? Or what is, what's your process for, what is free writing to you, I guess I'm asking? So free writing, <laughs> um, I learned about it in high school and I fell in love, but um, you just put your pen to the paper and you start and you don't stop for 10 minutes. Sometimes you can have a topic if you want, but like I, I try to just start by writing just immediately and I don't stop. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds, again, that sounds therapeutic and meditative <laughs> at the same time. I'm, I'm liking where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a librarian, uh, so forgive me for indulging here. Uh, I have to ask everyone. Uh, do you have a favorite memory about a library or a librarian or even a teacher? I just I, I really enjoy hearing uh, people's stories about the you know def especially the librarians that they maybe encountered. Usually it's that encounter when they were a kid, somebody that just kind of gets them. Once in a while you get a good horror story from somebody and I say, well, my gosh, I hope that wasn't ever me. Uh, you, you don't know. I hope not. Um, but yeah, do you have any any stories? Well, um, I used to go to the Crandall Library in Glens Falls a lot mm -hmm. as a kid. Um, but like that place especially and um, the, the school library when I was in Catholic school, they just seemed like very um, sacred places. Because um, like, there's just tons of information there and like the smell of books, it's like very just inviting and I love that. Um, as far as what got me started, though, it was actually a um, uh, an assignment in, I think it was seventh grade English class. We had to memorize um, a poem, and I memorized Emily Dickinson's I'm Nobody, Who Are You? And I fell in love with her after that, and I fell in love with the idea of poetry. I read, like, I just I kept reading up on her specifically. Um, and then it branched out from there, and I've been writing since. So, yeah. Can I ask? Have you ever been able? Have you have you ever been able to share that story with the teacher that gave you that writing assignment? No, because uh -oh. <laughs> that, that same teacher <laughs> also called my parents in once because on the topic of writing, um, she gave us a list of uh, vocab words for the week. And I was like, oh, I'll use these to write a poem. And I wrote a poem, but it was about like the underworld. That was the title of it. And um, she apparently thought that I was obsessed with the occult and uh, the devil and stuff like that. So she called my parents. And so like that equally, it's, uh, it's this weird. Okay. Yeah. You, you did say Catholic school, right? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. You know, because I'm sitting there going like, oh, I totally wrote all that stuff when I was in school. And it was like, oh, yeah, you're another, you know, 90s kid in, in high school writing stuff about the occult and Crowley. All right. You know. So, okay, I get it now. So that's interesting. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> uh, do you ever Google yourself or check mentions on social media or read online reviews? Uh, if so, do you have any favorite or memorable for whatever reason results that you've unearthed um i i don't really google myself i have um a few social media platforms that i utilize uh youtube is one of them i record my open mic nights and i'll post those but um i don't really get a lot of uh, feedback on it i will get feedback at the open mic nights yeah. though and that that means a lot to me if somebody comes up to me afterwards and it's like hey i really enjoy that it 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 touches me yeah so, yeah gotcha and here's the fun one, I, at least I like to think it is. Um, if you could describe or define yourself in just one word, what would it be? I would have to say manic because, <laughs> I mean, I'm writing about life and life is all over the place. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, manic. Again, I like that because there, there's a lot in that. Manic, life is a lot. It's all over the place. I'm like, yeah, that's 
using an economy of words, that's a whole lot yeah. all at <laughs> one time. <laughs> so, speaking of words, um, would you care to do a reading Absolutely. for us? Yeah. All right. Well, Michael, thank you, and the author stage is yours, my friend. Thank you. This is called uh, 9 to 5. I awake from my sleep's commotions, then grab the pills that bottle my emotions. Every day I'm Charlie Brown bagging, eyes so heavy that my ass is dragging. Sunlight hits me, now I'm Nosferatu, but I keep going, though I don't want to. Instead I French press my storm clouds and prepare, war paint the game face under the mask I wear. Pageant smiles with waves like a tsunami, business casual corporate origami. Fold me, fake me, and file me away, from box to box, from cubicle to the grave. The red, white, and blue collar rat race is all uphill when you're a slave to the American dream, slave to the dollar bill. Thank you, Michael, for sharing that with us today. And also, thank you for spending your time here with us on the author stage. And so to properly promote you and your work and everything about you, uh, where can people find you, whether it's in real life, uh, online, I know you mentioned YouTube, uh, and also most importantly, where can people find your work and purchase your work? So, I mean, obviously I'm uh, working with Saratoga Library, uh, so I'll continue to donate books there, so always check there. Um, I attend open mic nights at um, Cafe Lita in Saratoga, yep. the first Wednesday of every month. Um, you can go to Linktree at Michael A. Carroll Poetry um, for a list of like all my social media accounts, and uh, my books are available on Amazon. Wonderful. Well, the time has come for us to take our bows and leave the author stage. Many thanks again to Universal Preservation Hall and Proctor's Collaborative and the Saratoga Springs Public Library for their partnership on this program. And most of all, a big thank you to our guest, Michael A. Carroll, for joining us on the stage. I'm Trevor Oakley, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Be sure to read something good today.